In this essay from the January 2012 exam, it's actually a rather new question which is interesting because it refers to the case study and also it takes a look at four different methods and asks you to discuss the, uh, each of them and see how effective they are. Now I could see where this would trip up most students because it's saying discuss which of these ways might be the most effective in correcting this form of market failure. Now some of you might read that to mean I'll pick one method and I'll discuss how effective it is and argue back and forth, offer an alternative and evaluate because that's what you've always been taught with the 18 mark question. But in this instance you need to actually talk about all four explain how they work, explain their drawbacks, and then evaluate how effective they are. So in this essay what I'm looking for is a definition of market failure, a listing of the four different methods with their explanation, uh, how they may be effective, what the market failure actually is, and then finally coming to an evaluation of which method will work the best. Now what I would like to see there is a ranking of the four methods, which one is the most effective uh, down to the least effective. So let's get started taking a look at this essay written by a student. Okay, in many ways the market failure, which is when production or consumption leads to an inefficient allocation of resources which manages to hinder economic and social welfare can correct the negative externalities in four ways. Okay, first of all, uh, English grammar needs uh, a lot of work here. It needs to be clear and fluid. I have to be able to read this without thinking uh, what is he saying because you start off in one, in one manner and then you end in another. Um, in the sense that you say in many ways a market failure, then you define it. So just you know, stick to market failure is this, and then go on to continue from there. Uh, first being the banning of the sale of chewing gum. Second, information on consequences of chewing gum. Uh, and an indirect tax being imposed, and lastly, heavy fines for those who drop chewing gum on the streets. All of these which have their merits, but which is most effective, okay? A little bit long, but you can make that cleaner, right? Make it read a little bit cleaner. There is some evidence and argument to support that banning the sale of chewing gum is a great way to correct the market failure imposed by negative externalities. Now you want to say banning the sale of chewing gum is a great way to correct the market failure, uh, which includes a problem of discarded chewing gum. Make sure it's clear. Uh, for example, banning chewing gums allows building owners, pedestrians, and consumers to not worry about chewing gum being stepped on or damaging the building and the negative externalities it produces. Right? This question is asking you about the cost of the government of cleaning it up. Well, we can talk about this negative externality. Yes, you don't really bring up the fact that it costs money to clean up. Right? So you need to make sure you bring that up. Uh, so the supply of chewing gum will be zero, resulting in no chewing gum being sold and causing the ne negative externalities just seen to be seen in Singapore in 1992. Again, uh, language, right? Clear for me. However, there are limitations in the fact that banning the sale of chewing gum causes unemployment for thousands of labor workers, which cause a marginal social cost and negative externality since the man or woman who went to work at a chewing gum factory has no more income, his or her family has an effect as an effect will suffer tremendously resulting in market failure as there is an economic and social loss involved. Right, you're throwing a lot of economic terms around. You can you can say this a lot easier. Just you know, you don't have to use key terms at every corner. You can say what you want to say without having to worry about that. Uh, furthermore, there are also f negative externalities for the NHS in the process. If it was an overall ban, unlike the free trade agreement, a great deal of strain will be put on the NHS to satisfy the smokers who have lost their therapeutic gum causing even further issues for the NHS. Now, a great deal of strain because smokers can't access gum. That I don't know if that's a stretch or if that's within reason, but you, know, you could mention it. I would say just emphasize it maybe a little bit less. But what you have done here is discuss the ban, how it's effective, and how it won't be. You, you could have used a diagram as well to show it, but you know, I think ban, making supply next to zero, it's, yeah, it's not necessary. In some respects, information and advertisement will result in the least consequences for families and will provide not too many hindrances apart from costs. Right, so you can say that the information provision, uh, will, the main issue will be cost. Uh, but the other problem is, you, I would say you would need to discuss that that cost of information provision by the government is met with tax revenue. Okay, so let's see if that comes up later on. For example, many consumers are not updated with recent news or even the bare minimum, bare minimum for understanding the cost of discarded chewing gum. Okay, asymmetric information is a form of market failure of which there is an imbalance of information where the consumer knows less than the producer. Okay, through education and demonstrations, people can be taught the consequences of chewing gum for every day and how they believe bin men pick up discarded chewing gum when it is extremely tough to remove from streets and buildings.
Okay, I'm fine with this. To correct both of these market failures in one, the introduction of consequences on negative externalities is limited since people will have the information regardless, but it has been it has been proven effective since some citizens will still discard chewing gum anyway. All right, there's something you kind of take a little bit of a different direction. You talk about the introducing consequences really briefly. Uh, I don't know if you meant. I don't know. I don't know. I actually, don't know what that means. Are you talking about a fine? Uh, some some form of punishment, but it just quickly pokes its head in here, and then that's the end of that. And then we move it to the third method, but you have again you have looked at uh, the positive and the negative of uh, information provision. Another method widely used across many firms and businesses impeded by the government is direct ta indirect taxation. All right. Uh, another method widely used across many firms and businesses imposed by the government, I'd say, uh, is an indirect taxation. Um, diagram to show indirect taxation, okay, accurately labeled, looks good, Re increases price, reduces quantity supply to the market, happy. Uh, so that shows us how it works, and then you go on to explain it. And then you say, <clears throat> here, from the diagram, as an indirect tax is imposed, Supply shifts left from S to S1, resulting in a price increase from P to P1 and a quantity decrease from Q to Q1. Imposing a tax sends price signals to consumers on the amount they're willing to pay for chewing gum. As a result, demand stays the same. Okay, you say demand stays the same. I agree the demand curve doesn't move, but there is a contraction in demand, right? I would use that terminology to explain what happens here. Uh, consumers will stop investing, spending money into chewing gum. As soon as a certain price is reached to which the consumer can no longer afford to want to buy chewing gum, which for many on lower incomes results in less sales, but some negative, still some negative externalities. Uh, since chewing gum is, a, is elastic, I would say it's more inelastic, right? Because it's such a small portion of people's income that an increase in price is not going to change quantity demand that much. Um, I think you meant that, but you just typed it wrong. Furthermore, the money gained from the tax could be used to contribute to schemes of work and action awareness to ensure that there is a reduced number of incidents in which discarded chewing gum is seen. Excellent. Now, use the money from the tax to help it work further. However, the government could choose to use the money for the deficit or to subsidize another business or firm, not necessarily relating to the problem at hand. Okay, now you talk about why it may not work. Uh, another thing I want you to say is, you know, take a look at why tax isn't effective. I think you did mention it here um, with the inelastic portion. Uh, the money could be used. Okay, if I look at this, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with this, right? It's a little, it's sometimes a little bit unclear, but I get the point. So I see your analysis and it's clear you understand what you're talking about. So the fourth one is the least, the last and least favorable method is heavy fines for those who discard chewing gum on the streets. Now, what you've done right here is you said the last and least favorable method. Uh, least favorable for who? Right? I'm, we're talking about effective, not favorable. That's, you know, there's, why are you bringing this kind of opinion into it? It's heavy fines for those who discard chewing gum on the streets. A way in which this could work is providing consumers with consequences. Uh, there will be an opportunity cost. There will be a punishment for consumers who decide to litter in the form of a fine. This could be extremely unfair to consumers who are not up to date with information. Uh, this part here, a middle-aged person who isn't very up to date with the news, uh, then discards chewing gum as a result, can produce excuses or be the victim of something he knew nothing about. Uh, yeah, so you could argue that awareness needs to be there for in order for the fine to be effective because some people may not be aware of it. Uh, that could be a potential drawback of it. And then, yes, you make a good point here, which in turn costs a lot of money to fund such a campaign. So this method is deemed inefficient. Another thing I think you did say is even if there is a fine or a ban, you'd have to catch everybody doing it. You know, it's going to be expensive to enforce because you can't stop every single person from spitting out gum. It would have to be a pretty extensive campaign. You could have clarified this a little bit further. Okay, to sum up, although the methods of discarding chewing gum all have their merits with correcting market failure, the consequences, however, cause more trouble than what they are worth, with many leading to greater market failure and greater social and economic loss, which results in an inefficient allocation of resources. You, you, you're throwing in economic terms like, like excessively throughout. But I don't know if it's because you feel confident just the word back in or you just you know you're not comfortable with using your own terminology but I think that what you should do is really focus on you know, just making it as clear as you can the most effective way in which to deal with chewing gum is the use of information awareness if a big enough influence is placed on spreading information of the consequences out 
it will become second nature to people thinking of discarding chewing gum, although many people can ignore the information. Okay, now here you say this is the most effective way. Right? And you're now ranking, you're saying this is the most effective way, number one. Many have the choice and awareness of the opportunity cost, uh, will now indeed choose to, instead of discarding on the street, put it in bins, improving environmental, economic, and social welfare. Then you say you have 13 out of 18 from your teacher, which comes as no surprise. The main reason being this, to get a full 18 out of 18, your evaluation needs to look at each method and rank which one is the most effective. Uh, you did rank which one is, but you didn't then put the second, third, and fourth. And another piece of advice I could give you is to evaluate throughout. Rather than waiting till the conclusion, as you end each paragraph, write why this method may not be effective. The for and against, yes. The limitations of the tax, you could say, are the size of the tax is going to be difficult to determine. Right? You do evaluate some, but you need more than this to get up to that 18 mark. Uh, when you talk about a ban, for example, is the problem big enough to merit a ban on the sale of chewing gum? or the supply of chewing gum. Uh, there's more evaluation that you could add in here. Your analysis, at times it's a little bit unclear, but I think for the most part it's evident you know what you're talking about, which is why you're stopped at 13 out of 18. Um, I'd say language and the evaluation skill is what prevents this from moving up in points.